today we have the pleasure to have uh, Laura Leal uh, from Goldman Sachs and uh, Princeton University uh, presenting uh, learning a functional control for uh, high frequency uh, fines. Uh, Laura, uh, the stage is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Ricardo. So first of all, thank you for welcoming me here to the seminar. Um, I do have a disclaimer to make that all this work was done in Princeton, uh, not in Goldman. So this was before I joined. All the data is research academia data. So not at all from Goldman. And all the research is also not at all related to Goldman. So disclaimer made. <laughs> Uh, let's get started. So this in this talk, we're going to learn a functional control for high frequency finance. Uh, and this is joint work with Mathieu Laurier and Charles Belleal. Mathieu is now at NYU Shanghai as assistant professor. Um, so so the, the gist of the problem is that we have a large trader. Uh, and that means an institutional trader, not mom and pop. And they want to either buy or sell a large amount of stocks in a fixed amount of time, capital T. So that would be a trading day for us. And of course, as we know, large trades have market impact, which is detrimental both to our performance and to what the uh, CVM or SEC is going to think of us. So we want to avoid that. And in this particular presentation, we're going to consider the problem of a trader uh, who wants to solve the optimal execution problem. <coughs> Sorry, there was some noise. Uh, that is part of uh, the wider array of stochastic optimization problems. And the way we're going to solve it is by using neural networks. So we're using the, the property of neural networks that they're universal approximators. So instead of using the regular like oh, we're going to train on some data, test on some data. Here, we're, the neural network is, out, is going to output a control. So it is going to be itself the solution to the stochastic optimization problem. And then we, we face the regular uh, problems of neural networks. Well, how do we explain this black box? What is it doing? Right? So we came up with the idea of model dist distillation which is, well, we know the closed form solution to this problem. Why don't we project uh, the neural network solution onto the manifold of the known solution so that we can have at least a measure of like how much risk we're adding to it, how far away from the known and comfortable solution we are right now. And then of course we wanna evaluate performance. So what is our value function? What is our wealth mark to market? And what is the relative error in the projection uh, once we project the neural network solution onto the closed form? And then we move on to more realistic optimal execution scheme. So this, this part uh, stops being generic and goes into like, well, for optimal execution, can we just like learn any multi-preference uh, control? Uh, meaning in the beginning of the trading day, if my risk preferences change, uh, do I need to retrain a neural network? And the answer is no. We don't need to wake up at 4 a.m. to retrain. We just input the risk aversion parameters for today and move on with trading. So the outline is simple. Uh, some literature to put in context and then the optimal execution model, if anyone is not familiar with it, uh, how we find the neural network control, some numerical results and conclusions. So a few related references, the classic uh, setup for this problem actually comes from Algren and Chris. There is some previous like uh, testing out uh, the area by Bersimas and Lowe. And Cartier and Jai Mongo were actually at the forefront of these, this research for a long time. So they published a lot of papers on it and uh, ultimately a book on it. And then we're in between learning, which is like, learning from data using neural networks. Reinforcement learning, which this paper may or may not be considered reinforcement learning, depending on how you define reinforcement learning. Uh, <coughs> for us, we wait until the end of the trading day 
to update the parameters of the neural network. So it's not online learning. This is the same as AlphaGo, for example, which is considered reinforcement learning. But for me, since it's not online learning, I don't want to claim it is reinforcement learning. And then finally, deep learning techniques. These are more technical papers in mathematics that try to approximate uh, PDEs solutions using neural networks. So here, the, op the stochastic optimal control problem, we would solve by first finding the, the first order condition, which would be a PDE. And then uh, we would solve this PDE either by approximation or by closed form. So in these papers, they're worried about this PDE. And for us, we're one level before that. We don't need to even find this PDE. We directly solve the stochastic optimization problem. Okay. So here's our model. Uh, we want to buy or sell some stocks. We have some state variables, which are the inventory of the agent. In this case, it's just a matter of speed of trading, new T. This is our control and how it evolves in time. Uh, I have a second paper which argues that this should not be the equation to be used. So we argue that there should be a Brownian motion component here, uh, but I'll leave that for later for another presentation. Uh, then the price evolves according to a drift diffusion uh, process. So we have a permanent market impact that depends on the speed of trading of the agent. And here usually, uh, we have this market impact uh, parameter that is static throughout the day. For us, it is not necessarily static. So here we can embed intraday um, changes in volume and in spread. And, and, and this is also going to affect our speed of trading, our control. And the reason is that if, if you have, for example, more market volume uh, in the limit order book, you would then be able to trade faster and have less market impact. So we adapt to, to market directly. And here, uh, this diffusion term, it could either be as it's written here, uh, just like generated by Monte Carlo. So you, you can generate this noise, or it can come directly from the data, the real data. And finally, the wealth of the agent is a quadratic function of our control, our speed of trading. So you start from the midpoint, that ST, this is the price, and you're going to cross the spread either to buy or to sell, but you're always crossing the spread, which means you were assuming that you have a market order. Right? You're always trading with market order. So this is an assumption. Uh, and you pay a temporary market impact uh, for crossing this spread, which might cross and then go into the book as you trade. So this is a transaction cost, which you always pay. Uh, and finally, we have uh, an objective to maximize. We want to maximize the cash that the agent has at the end of the day. So this is the wealth in cash, plus how much you can sell your final inventory uh, at the end of day price. So this is implicitly assuming that you can execute at, let's say, the closing auction, everything you have left um, and, and come up with a price. And then you have two penalty terms. Uh, the first one is a, is a end of day penalty term. So if you have not executed your inventory, you suffer a penalty at the end of the day. And the second one is throughout the day, you also want to be forcing the agent to execute. So you also want to penalize them uh, throughout the day. And here, usually this parameter gamma is set to two. So all across the literature, it is set to two, quadratic term. We don't find that realistic. So we set it to gamma and we have a comparison of gamma equals three over two versus two. Uh, and the, and, the, and Okay, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this is the explanation of, that I just presented. And these parameters here, A and phi, these are important for risk management. So the, the greater A and phi are, the more you're going to force the agent to complete the goal of executing this inventory today, right? And 
if they're loser, it's the opposite. So you can keep some inventory for tomorrow. You can, you can think about uh, how to execute it in a, on another day. Um, the, what people don't mention here is that this objective function actually is forcing us to front load the strategy. So uh, these two penalty terms are gonna force us to execute earlier in the day versus later in the day, depending on how you set up these parameters, the risk aversion parameters. So this is just something to, to keep in mind if you're ever training optimal control problems. Laura, just to, to clarify, where the, the volatility is going to, well, the volatility should affect uh, the trading cost as well, right? Or... Yeah, so in this problem, the volatility is only, only coming in here. We're, sure. not, we're not taking into account uh, explicitly intraday volatility, although it is embedded in the spread, which is here. So when there's more vol, we do find that there's more spread and perhaps less volume on the, on the book. Uh, so that is embedded in this alpha term, but we did not handle uh, volatility explicitly here. Okay. And our goal is to find the optimal control, which is the solution to maximizing this problem with respect to the, uh, to the dynamics of the state variables. So let's back, back up a little bit. Um, this problem, I, we just set it up in discrete time because in neural network world, everything is gonna be coded up in a computer. So we need it in discrete time, but all across the literature, it has been done in continuous time, right? So uh, in continuous time, we wanna find a maximizer for this objective function subject to the dynamics and we wanna find new T. Uh, sorry, again, just to clarify again, the alpha before was time varying. Now it's is constant. Yeah. So here now I am showing the classic framework. Oh, the classic. Okay. I thought you were just uh, mapping the discrete time in the continuous time. Okay. Yes. No. So so this is the classic setup, and I'm going to show how it is solved. So here we have uh, it's all usually solved by hamilton jacobi bellman equation. Um, we have this intermediary step which we don't have in the neural network. And if we assume gamma equals two, we can actually find a closed form solution uh, through Cartier and Jaimungo, which is that the optimal control is a linear function of the inventory, right? And here from all this uh, math that I went through very fast, the important thing for us is to remember that Speed of trading is a linear function of the inventory, and we want to find a relation. We, we are going to compare to this solution, and we are going to compare H1 and H2 because the rest are just constants. So we want to compare these two terms evolving over time. Uh, and this is just a description that these H1, H2, and H0, they, they can be found through a system of ODEs which is very simple to solve. So here we just have a Riccati equation, first order ODE, and the last term is just zero. So it's like something easy to solve. Uh, we can find these terms directly in closed form. But the thing to remember is that the reason why we want to look at neural networks is because even though we have closed form solution for the PD, it's not the most realistic thing we can do. It's not as close as possible to the market. And I'll show uh, very soon why. But first, uh, what is the equivalent problem in neural network world, right? As you see, it's the exact same thing, right? And we still want to find new. But now new is a function of thetas, which are the weights and biases of a neural network, right? So instead of showing you a uh, function, we're going to show you, well, this function is dependent on parameters, which we're gonna train from the data. And the how we train it is also very simple. So we're gonna update this, these parameters. So theta at k plus one equals theta at k plus some term that depends on the gradient of the objective function with respect to these parameters. 
So we're going to update the parameters according to uh, stochastic gradient descent algorithm. Uh, and then if you're interested in technical details, I can go over them later, but it, this is done in TensorFlow. Uh, we do have some, some ways of uh, avoiding overfit, and, and if you're interested, we can discuss it. So in our implementation, we have a feed-forward fully connected neural network, um, and we have only a few layers. So this is not a very deep neural network. It's enough to approximate universally whatever solution we find, but it's not very deep. The deep part here comes from the fact that it's recurrent. So at each time step, we, we use the same neural network over and over again. And at the end of the trading day, we're gonna update the weights uh, for this network for all the time steps. So the input to the network is actually time and inventory. We could have more. We could have, for example, as we're going to use later, the risk preference parameters, the risk aversion parameters. But it can be generalized to other dimensions. But here we only focus on these. Uh, and the reason why we start with time and inventory is because in the closed form solution, uh, the control is a function of time and inventory. So if we had a completely different uh, stochastic optimization problem with a completely different set of solutions, we could use different inputs. And also, if we had no idea a priori what is a closed form solution, does this even exist, we would use time and all the state variables that we're considering. Um, so this is the structure. If you look at figure two below, uh, these are the steps that I was describing. So we take time and inventory in this case, not, not all of the state variables, uh, and we input to the network. The network then in figure one takes these inputs and, and trains uh, the parameters according to a stochastic uh, gradient descent algorithm. And then we plug this, in, this control back into the state variable equations and obtain the next step for the state variables. So, we do this over and over again until we reach time t. And this is where we then update the weights for this one neural network that is being used on all the time steps. So how do we train this network? So for this, we need to generate sample paths. We could use real data, but a priori, we didn't know if we had enough data because there's no theorem saying like, well, this is the exact amount of data that I need to reach convergence. Um, so the idea we had was, well, let's start training the network on simulated data. And this simulated data is retrieved from, um, from the same distribution as the real data. So we estimate parameters from the real data and then generate as much data as we need to train the network. Turns out we didn't need that much data in the end, but that's something we didn't know a priori. Um, so it's set like this. And then we continue training on real data for fine tuning. So to make sure that it's really learning everything. Uh, so the data itself, again, this comes from Princeton, not from Goldman. Uh, this is from Toronto Stock Exchange. We had data for 503 trading days. It's arguably old data but the microstructure for this particular problem did not change in this time. Uh, so it, it doesn't really matter for us. And we have 19 stocks across many industries. Here, I'm only gonna show one stock, which is MRG. Uh, the data is in microseconds, but it's asynchronous. And for this type of problem, which is a, a risk control problem in its essence, uh, we don't need asynchronous data. So we aggregate the data into 78 bins of five minutes uh, intraday. So why do we want to use the neural network in the first place, as I was mentioning? Uh, and the reason is that the PDE solution assu assumes a lot about the data. So in the PDE solution, we have no room for autocorrelation in the data. We have no room for heavy tails. And especially, we have no room for intraday seasonality, which in the, in the neural network solution, we are not worried about. We actually tried, um, and it's like in the 
appendix of my thesis, we tried modeling uh, the intraday seasonality in, in PDE form, and it becomes very involved very fast. So as, as you progress towards more realistic market scenarios, really quickly, it becomes infeasible to do using the classic uh, setup. While in neural network world, it's just, well, the data is learning for me. So it's very straightforward. But then, okay, but what is it actually doing, right? So we came up with this explainability idea, which is essential for uh, risk, risk sectors in any firm. If we want to use this in trading, for example. And just uh, yeah. one question. So, so to train the network, you, you, you basically use an HAB equation that's derived from a model under some assumptions. No. Uh, or, no. or not, no, not, okay. So to train the network, we only need the structure of the stochastic optimization problem. We do not need a PDE at all. The reason why I showed a PDE is that I'm gonna project the neural network solution onto the closed form solution for this particular problem. Okay, got it. Because this was the first time that neural networks were being used for this at all. So we, we needed to make sure that, well, it is one, doing the right thing. And two, we need to be able to explain this um, in terms of risk, if anyone's ever going to be able to use it, right? So, so this was the idea. But in theory, you don't need the PD at all. If you just if you trust the neural network solution, you don't even need to project it on something else. So th this was just the check to well, it's working and why and how far from the original solution in case you you move towards something nonlinear instead of the existing linear. Because kind of behind my question, what I had in mind was whether uh, the loss function that you're using is itself robust to like autocorrelation and, and so on. Yeah, so, so in terms of the loss function, we were not as worried about that because within each trading firm, you will have a lot of different setups for this loss function. So this was more like a proof of concept than the actual uh, trading setup if you if you know what i mean like so as i mentioned like this particular strategy is going to front load the orders other strategies might back load the orders so it's really up to like each trading desk to find what is their preference right so here's a proof of concept using um, classic literature because we wanted to be able to compare our method yeah. <laughs> so sorry, it's not the actual trading algorithm. Uh, th does that answer the question? Or? Yeah, it does. Okay. So as a reminder, we're going to compare to gamma equals two solution, where the control is a linear function of the inventory. And the idea is that at every time step t, we're going to project the solution onto this, this space of linear functions of the inventory. So, and here is very simple. We're going to use an OLS regression where we're going to project the neural network solution onto linear functions, right? So this part is very simple. It's just a matter of, well, we want to be able to explain what's going on. And the, the R square is going to just tell us how much of the nonlinear functional can be projected onto this place of closed form solution closed form controls at each time. So here's the first set of results for gamma equals two. So for now, we're benchmarking the neural network against the existing solution. So these two lines, like stylized closed form, is the classic PD solution. And then we have neural network on simulations mimicking it precisely. So neural network on simulations has exactly the same assumptions across the board as the PD. So we have uh, Monte Carlo increments that are normal zero one. Uh, everything is uh, kosher, right, as they say. And then we start adding things to the neural network. So we start adding seasonality uh, in, in both like spread and volume. And we notice a big shift in, in the solution for the control. We add uh, 
real data next. So first we have simulations with seasonality, then real data with seasonality. And finally, a multi-preference control. Um, so this is like when we learn the parameters uh, for risk aversion as well. So here's the average control process. Um, the blue and, and, and gray are very, very close to each other with a tiny error for neural network approximation, which is arguably irrelevant in terms of a trading firm. Uh, and then once we introduce uh, seasonality, we start seeing that the agent is not gonna execute as much in the beginning of the day where the spreads are very high and it's instead gonna execute more uh, at the end of the day with, where volumes uh, are very high. So, and, and this, this for us is, is the biggest uh, learn from the neural network. And uh, yeah, so, so, so this, and, and this here, you're seeing the, the graph for only one side. So this is the side that we're buying. The, so here the control is, so let's say we're buying 90,000 uh, per this five minute bins, 90,000 stocks. Uh, the sell side is perfectly symmetric in, the, in terms of the control. Uh, I'm gonna say it's not perfectly symmetric in terms of the wealth because the wealth is asymmetric. Uh, but it is symmetric in terms of mark to market wealth. So adjusted to beginning of day, it's, it's symmetric. And here the R squared for the case gamma equals two, we see that the network, so this is 0 0.9970, which is very high. I wanted to zoom in here because if I just put it from zero to one, it would be all very close to one. We wouldn't be able to see. But here we can see that the network is really converging towards something linear, but since it's learning, it's not perfectly linear, right? So it, you can still see like R squared deviating from one a little bit. And then we explore a different case, which is gamma equals three over two. So here the agent is not uh, necessarily being pushed to execute. Uh, and and the solution is no longer necessarily linear for the control. So here we see that for certain parameters, we still have a linear solution for the R squared and, and linear uh, considering each point in time, right? And then for a second set of parameters, loser parameters, we see the network assuming a nonlinear solution. So here is 0 0.4. Here's zero, so we actually reach a very, very nonlinear solution in this case. Uh, and then we want to look at the performance, right? So here, here, arguably, we're comparing apples to oranges, and I'm going to tell you why. So if we're comparing gamma equals two to gamma equals three over two, that is not a good thing to compare. So don't compare between the two plots, but intraplot, right? So here for gamma equals two, the value function for each value, each possible value of our initial inventory, so Q0, whether it's negative or positive, the distribution is very similar. So meaning the solutions that we find are more or less the same solutions. But for gamma equals three over two, the neural network is outperforming uh, by not every time, but most of the times. And then if we look at mark to market wealth, same thing. So here the neural network is more or less matching the problem, but in the case gamma equals three over two, you may be either um, spending less money to execute or making less money to execute. So, so you're, variance is lower in terms of mark to market wealth could either work in your favor or against you so it's not a win-win-win situation but sometimes maybe it's better to use a different model use the original model uh, and then we want to evaluate the performance of the network so we're going to look at the relative error in this control so we can we compare the learned control 
uh, from the neural network with the projected version. So, so the solution projected onto the classic, uh, the classic control. Uh, for gamma equals two on the left, we see that the, the relative error is very low across the board, except in the end where it's not really possible. And, and this is an interesting uh, neural network problem. Um, so in the end, the neural network has executed uh, everything, all the orders it had to execute. So it learned only to execute. Uh, so in the end, we don't have as many points uh, to estimate in the regression, therefore the relative error jumps up, but that's just because all the points in the end are like, we have executed, so everything is very close to zero. So the error jumps up because of that, not because the neural network hasn't learned, it's just because it's very hard to estimate a regression where everything is the same. Uh, and then for the case gamma equals three over two, the relative error jumps up uh, in the beginning by a lot, and that is because we have that nonlinear solution. But what this relative error gives us is how far away from the classic solution, the one we're comfortable with, uh, we now stand, right? So this is a way to explain risk departments, um, two risk departments, like how to understand one versus the other. And in trading, we don't necessarily want to use one or the other. So in each situation, it might be a different case as mark to market wealth uh, argued for us. Uh, this is a way to, to say like, well, if we choose one versus the other, uh, how, how would we be able to estimate this risk? And finally, for the multi-preference controller, here we're adding not only time and inventory to training the network, but also risk conversion parameters. And this is our argument against waking up at 4 a.m. to train a neural network. We want to have a neural network that will just be plug and play in the beginning of the day. So if let's say like the Fed decided something, uh, these parameters are going to change immediately and we can just then start, start trading. Uh, and these plots, they're showing the time steps until at least 90% of the order is executed. So here time steps uh, are in number of bins. So if you remember, we divided the day in 78 time bins. So this is, uh, it took eight bins to execute or it took the whole day to perhaps not even complete the execution. And the reason why this, this is happening is because we are loosening the risk aversion parameters. So as risk aversion parameters become looser, meaning, oh, we don't really need to execute this inventory, we might leave some for tomorrow, or we might um, end up executing before the end of the day, or we're just like, okay, I need to do this ASAP because I'm super risk averse and get it done, right? So the left-hand side is the PD solution, and the right-hand side is the neural network solution. So they are very similar in terms of schedule, but the neural network uh, here always seems to be executing a bit later. And the reason is that here we're considering the intraday seasonality. So uh, if you remember from a plot before, the, the control, uh, it was avoiding beginning of day trading uh, in the neural network control, while in the PD solution, we're like not even taking that into account because it's too hard to know. So that is what I had for today. So I'm just gonna wrap up. If you want a take home message, we use a neural network method to learn an optimal control, which is the solution to a stochastic optimization problem. So here we only need to define optimization problem run neural network, obtain control. We also used real data and seasonality. So the takeaway is like, well, neural networks can learn more than what our PD solutions are giving us. And we wanna explain what's happening. So we wanna project this solution to a lower dimensional space. So no more black box in terms of what the neural network is doing. And we wanna learn more than what we currently have. 
So we want to be able to adapt fast to market conditions. Okay, so this paper is on archive, if, uh, but it is coming out soon on uh, quant finance. And we do have another paper, and this, with, this is with Rene Carmona, it's a different co-author, on which we argue that actually the inventory process should have uh, a Brownian motion included. So that's more high frequency econometrics and not no neural networks involved. And if you want to discuss any research projects or just get to know each other in chat, uh, I'd be happy to. So please reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, very useful approach to, to learn about uh, investors uh, from the data. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, so guys, uh, if you have any, please. Well, I have many, so but I don't want to monopolize the discussion. So I, I, I will kick off with the first one and then we see how it goes. So I was a little, I think this, this was a, really interesting when we were talking about how you would train the, the neural networks and that you start using simulation simulated data because you were not sure how much of a sample size you would need to train it. And I think I have a, a different take. Um, this is a neural network approach, right? So you're not estimating you're not really estimating deep parameters, right? This is a predictive model. It's, um, so I guess if, if, if you consider that your model is misspecified, essentially what you need is to have uh, actually estimate a rolling window and you're going to capture, you know, like essentially the projection of your misspecified model on, on the correct, uh, on the correct model, which actually we actually don't know, it's not even the PD that you, you that you have. So it makes more sense to me that you're going to estimate using, you know, the previous day you estimate your model and then you use that. You know, like this estimation window has to be local somehow because there are so many characteristics that you're not modeling. For instance, seasonality, or which is something that we know that neural networks is going to you know, to handle somehow, but um, like stochastic volatility jumps, all these kind of uh, features that we know that are prevalent in the data and it's not in your model. So could you, could you come back a little bit to that, uh, to that decision, to that choice and, and, and um, not to the slide, but to the choice and talk a little bit about that. Cause you know, it, my, my take would be exactly the contrary. You know, you should use little data sample cannot be too too large and then obviously your results is are very reassuring because uh, they're essentially saying well we can indeed use uh, a, a smaller sample and uh, we will capture those you know features that are not in the model you know somehow because we we have this rolling window yeah so so we need to train some parameters in the network, right? Um, a priori, we don't know how much data we're gonna need. And for each problem, it's gonna be a different number of samples, right? So this, what you're mentioning, like in the rolling window, it, it makes sense if you already have like a basis from where to start. So it would kind of be the idea of, well, we start with oh, it's further ahead. We start with some simulation, and then we learn. We continue some learning on the these rolling windows. But we do need a starting point, right? Because a priori, we don't know what the parameters of the network are, right? So we do need some starting point. Um, so in this sense. For, for peace of mind, I would still start on simulated data. And here we didn't start on a random simulated data, right? We started on something that came from a process that was very similar to the real data. And this is, this is something for us was just like to help the network. You didn't really have to do something like that. 
Um, but again, a priori, we didn't know uh, even how the network would work. Something that we found really interesting as we were training, and, and it's not in the paper, it didn't make sense to show, uh, but it makes sense in the context of this question. So it's like, once we're training, we see the control converging if we save each step of the iteration, right? And it does look a bit like uh, what you would think of a viscosity solution. So each, each step uh, of the training is like the, the control is getting closer and closer to what we would expect the control to be. We're not sure if it will ever be exactly the same. Um, but we might set some epsilon for the approximation. So in terms of neural networks, it will always be an approximation. Right? It will never be a like closed form. Uh, so then what you need to think about is like, okay, how, how do I decide uh, when to stop and how do I decide when to start, right? Where to start? So for us, we started on simulated data that was similar to the real data. You, you may have a different um, starting point. For us, it made sense to be like, let's help out the network be as close as possible to the process that we're observing. And you can say, well, um, we observe jumps and we have a better modeling for the volatility, for example. Uh, and it would be a better uh, type of modeling and still the neural network would be able to handle it, right? So, in terms of having a better optimal control, it's just a matter of, okay, how well can you define, how well can you specify your model? So it ends up being a matter of like model specification and not like the network itself. The network will know eventually it's gonna converge. Uh, it doesn't take as much time as, as many iterations as we initially expected, but it's still gonna take some, <laughs> right? So yeah, so this, this is my take on it. It's just like, in terms of misspecification of the problem, you, you always have that, right? There's no perfect model ever, uh, but you can do a better job than what we're showing here in terms of specification. The reason why we didn't wanna show, oh, we didn't wanna include jumps and model volatility is because it was not the focus, right? So we just wanted to show that the neural network can learn the control and that we can compare it to something that already exists because we want people to trust that the neural network can do this. So the way to show that it can is to compare it to something that exists and not just show a solution that we don't know what it's about. So that's why we chose this problem. So I, I think I talked too much, but <laughs> overall, uh, yeah, let me know if you have more questions about this. Uh, Marcus. Please. Yes, uh, hi Laura, thanks for the, for the presentation. So uh, going back to the, to the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, so we... Yeah, yeah, this one or yes. one or... Oh, so yes. Yeah. So in terms of the of the control, so when we look at uh, let's say the the discount in terms of uh, let's say the the discount for something like the at the end of the the last action, thinking more about uh, when we look at uh, the seasonality of trading, and you will see that trading at the close is always much bigger volume or something. Is there some is there some kind of discontinuity in terms of the conditions that you can find in terms of trading during the day and at the close? Would would you find something different, uh, a kind of discontinuity in the parameters when you when you interact? That's an interesting in terms of this where we could not experience it. But uh, on the on the paper, maybe yeah, maybe I should not pull it up. But uh, on the second paper, we do show a bit. Um, so we we compare our proposed model 
against a real trader. Uh, so we, we do have, uh, it's, not, it's not trader, it's a broker, but they are executing optimally. Uh, and when we look at this type, their type of behavior, we actually see uh, a different setup for the execution, one that is not, uh, not consistent intraday, consistent in terms of they're always trading, not statistical consistency. Um, and we do see a, a very different pattern for execution at the end of the day. Uh, and the reason for that is the, the huge amount of volume traded at the end of the day. Uh, let's say like less 10, 15 minutes plus the closing option. So uh, in short, the answer is yes, there is, uh, not in this presentation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do, do, do we have any other? Well, I kept the ball rolling, yeah. So, <laughs> Go ahead, let's do have the, time. Yeah, so the neural networks, you know, like I, I, I was, I, I think perhaps I expressed myself not in the, in the best way. So I, I understand that you're looking at the neural networks as a way to solve the, the dynamic programming part. And it's, in that in, in that dimension, I was a little bit surprised by the architecture that you have chosen. You know, normally when we want to solve dynamic programming and control problems, we go for reinforcement learning. Do you have any? You know, and it works beautifully. You know, I I, I just don't want to. Uh, it, you know, it, but why didn't you go for a reinforcement learning ex ante? You know, like a, a priori. Why did you go for a simple take, which actually I was so glad to see that it, it works beautifully. So this is pre uh, reinforcement learning wave. That's one thing. Um, we started this work, uh, I think in 2018. So this, this was before that wave. Uh, the second reason is better <laughs> uh, because we did ex we did explore uh, using actual reinforcement learning. The problem with doing this is the environment, right? So for trading, we cannot do reinforcement learning real time because if you wanna trade an agent, you just cannot have the agent dying, which means bankruptcy for the firm. So it, all the training really needs to be offline. And in terms of having offline training, there are no good, there's some, but not good training environments. So, so there are some market simulators, but I personally don't really trust them. So, so I mean, you could train an agent for that particular environment, but once you want to trade it in the market, it's, it's not clear to me yet that it would be a good thing. You, you could still like have very, very poor performance and, and go bankrupt because your agent is not trained properly. So, so for me, that, that is like very interesting research question, but I would love to see uh, a lot more um, checks on whether it's working and a lot more checks on the environment to start with, uh, while, while here we're, we don't need an environment. We're using uh, real data. And of course, well, if a situation has not happened in the market before, the neural network may not react as expected, uh, but uh, it will react as expected everywhere else, right? While if we're training a reinforcement learning agent in an environment that is not even the market, then uh, yeah. So the agent in reinforcement learning is extremely dependent on, on incentives, right? So it gets rewards for doing things right. And doing things right uh, is judged by how the environment is gonna react to what they're doing. And if the environment is not set up properly, I mean, it's just out. <laughs> so, so yes, in that case, the problem of the closing being so far away from from now might be a problem because how do you, in the reinforcement learning problem, how do you 
how do you weight appropriately the reward if, if you start trading too too fast and you don't even reach the closing option you yeah. that part is a, a problem yeah, so, so that is one of the reasons why in this problem is is hard to do perfectly online because you, you do need if you're going to create a schedule for the trading day you do need to train the whole schedule so you, for that you need to wait until the end of the day right you cannot do i mean you can if you as, assume that uh, the limit order book doesn't have changes intraday, which it does, right? So in a sense, uh, you could train different environments. Uh, that, that would be an option. So you could train like, well, we're looking at beginning of day agent and we're looking at end of day agent. And then we have a scheduler to then send uh, orders to these different agents at different times, but it does become involved. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't know, you can go wild with this, but but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't assume an agent that looks locally at the limit order book as seeing the whole picture. I think it's the same thing that we're seeing. But you can predict there's no patterns, right? You know, you can predict what is going to happen with the order book. Perhaps predictions are not great, but uh, you can accommodate those uncertainties as well, right? Yes, it depends on how you do it. Yeah. Okay. Muito bem. Uh, Laura, muito obrigado. Obrigado. Uh, Obrigada a todo mundo que veio e... Foi ótimo. É.